Welcome to Bethel Baptist Church this evening as we find our seats. Let's go to hymn 273. If you're able to stand and join me, hymn 273, Bill my cup. <laughs> Thank you. 
yet. Please make sure that's taken care of. It won't be a dis distraction tonight. Uh, let's remember the teen activity this Saturday. So you can drop your young people off here at the church at 9 a.m. and pick them up. It'll be between 1.30 and 2 o'clock. And so look forward to teens. We're no doubt looking forward to that activity this this coming uh, Saturday. And then remember as well, we have a business meeting uh, tonight. And then we get toward the end of the month here. We've got our school fall break. And uh, then we're looking into October at the men's conference. So uh, please get signed up for that if you're planning to go. We have a good number signed up already, but the deadline is a week from tonight. So if, you, if you're wanting to go to the men's conference, please get signed up for that. There's some more details back there about it. And then remember also that we're about 40 days out now from our fall revival with Evangelist Will Rice. So let's be in prayer for that meeting, October 23rd to the 26th, Sunday to Wednesday meeting. And so we look forward to uh, that special time where we're going to focus on revival. We'll let God work in us and through us. And hopefully we'll see some people saved or uh, made right with the Lord and brought back into the church family. And so let's be praying about, about these opportunities. All right, my dad will come receive our offering tonight. All right, good evening. Let's have the ushers come. And the offering tonight goes to Bethel Baptist School, unless otherwise designated. Blessings be in the house of the Lord. I told my wife this morning, I said, can you believe it's almost the middle of September? I mean, time hurries on. Uh, Pastor Brent, we thank the Lord for the offering, please. Uh, our Lord, we thank you uh, for this day that you gave us, Lord, and bring us here safe to church tonight. We ask that you bless Pastor Knight and deliver us your word. Uh, the supply of truth that we hear, Lord, and we pray that you bless his offering, Lord, and also be a blessing to the school. And that, Lord, as you continue to help us to have a good school year. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. tonight, Daniel chapter 2. I sure hope you're enjoying our series here through the book of Daniel as I am. And one of the challenges of preaching through a book of the Bible is I, as a pastor anyway, my, my perspective is I, I don't want to, I don't want to get bogged down when people think we're preaching the same thing every time we're in the in our series. And the other side of that is I don't want to rush either. I want to make sure we get everything that we should. And so there's this, the second chapter is, is obviously loaded as the book's only 12 chapters long, but this second chapter is loaded with a lot of great um, principles and truths. And so I hope that uh, I hope we're, we're coming and seeking what God has for us uh, each time that we gather together um, usually on Wednesday evenings for our, our series here in the book of book of Daniel. So let's stand together, if you would, and we'll look here at uh, Daniel. We, we looked at the paragraph focused on, on verses 14 to 23 last time. Our focus tonight will be 24 to 30, that paragraph. But let's pick it up at verse 23 because it really sets the, the foundation for where we are here in, in uh, the life of Daniel and really the life of Nebuchadnezzar and the world at this time. Verse 23, Daniel chapter 2. Daniel prayed, I thank thee and praise thee, O God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might and has made known unto me now what we desire of thee, 
for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon, bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said unto him, I have found a man of the captains, captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, of course that was his Babylonian name, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. Now at this point, you have to wonder what Arioch was thinking. <laughs> and you might wonder what Nebuchadnezzar was thinking. Well, why did they rush you in here before me? And Arioch's going, wait a minute, I just told the king that I had found you and you could tell him. And you just said nobody could. There may have been just a little bit of a pregnant pause here in Daniel's speech. I don't know. But verse 28, But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed, what should come to pass hereafter, and he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. I want to talk to you tonight about the righteous, more specifically the worth of the righteous. Father, help us as we look into your word. I pray that you again speak through me. I pray for your cleansing. And Lord, I pray for your power. I pray the Holy Spirit would do his work in each of our hearts and lives. Lord, help us to see the worth of the righteous, of righteousness. Draw us closer to you. Helps to be better testimonies for thee. And Lord, as always, if there be any among us or any who tuned in tonight that don't know you as your personal Lord and Savior, I pray they trust you this evening. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. So, we began the chapter with King Nebuchadnezzar being troubled about some dreams that he had. And we draw from that and understand that it was most likely a recurring dream that troubled him. Nebuchadnezzar, as we are able to pick up from our text tonight, was concerned about where the kingdom was going and where he, where he would be and where Babylon would be going forward. He was concerned about these things. So he had had this dream, it troubled him, and uh, because of that he wanted his counselors, his his wise counselors, the wise men, the Chaldeans as they're called, and other descriptions that are given here. Uh, he wanted them to reveal to him what he had dreamed, and then also what the dream meant. Give me the interpretation of the dream. They stalled for time, and in a fit of frustration, the king said, well, if you can't, if you can't be the wise men I have asked you to be, then I'm just going to eliminate all of you. Uh, we're going to execute every one of you. Upon that news getting out, Arioch, the king's uh, probably secret service man, uh, went to Daniel and his friends and informed them that there's been an execution, execution order and, and uh, you're going to be executed, and it was with haste. I don't know if it was going to be that evening or the next day, but Daniel said, let me go talk to Nebuchadnezzar. He brought him in, and, and Nebuchadnezzar gave Daniel the time. And we looked last, last week at the request, and the, the beauty of the fact that God hears the requests of his own. Yeah. We can go boldly before the throne of grace because of the finished work of Christ at Calvary. We have access to the throne of heaven. And God heard Daniel's request and the request of his three faithful friends. So they made their re request to God. And upon, upon receiving the information, receiving the news from God, the, the, the dream and the interpretation of it, God had graciously answered their prayer. Daniel gives great praise to the Lord. 
Praise to God who reigns over the earth sovereigns. God setteth up one and putteth down another. Praise to God that the fact that he governs the seasons. I'm thankful to live in a part of the country where we enjoy the seasons. I don't like it super hot. I don't like it super cold. This is a pretty pretty nice uh, place. There are a few, few days in the winter that's a little frigid, and a few days in the summer that's a little bit too hot. But for the most part, we get to enjoy the seasonal changes. And, and I, I come to enjoy all of them. We all like some more than others, but uh, enjoy the, the seasons that we have here. God is in control of these things. God controls the climate. We rest in him. We rest in him. And it is also God who, who knows the secrets of man. He knows the secrets of the heart of men. And God knew the secrets that uh, Nebuchadnezzar was concerned about. So tonight we pick up the story here with Daniel being rushed in before the king. And we're going to see the emphasis here on the worth of the righteous. And first of all, I want us to see the value of the righteous. Notice with me again there in verse 24. Therefore Daniel went in unto Ariok, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the men of Babylon, bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. So we would gather from verse 24 that either Daniel hadn't been uh, read into the, the plan here or the timeline of the king, or he had and he knew there was only so much time. Daniel had to get the answer to the king or the king was going to execute everybody. Daniel said, told the uh, hit the brakes on this, take me to the king. We can understand why, why that would be the case. So, so we see the value of the righteous. You know, most people discount the value of righteousness. Right. Most people look at righteousness as some sort of excise or excess tax. Even many believers. Some look at being righteous as, as a problem rather than a blessing. Keep your place here in Daniel, if you would. And let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You know, Daniel was a righteous man. We've looked at that in the first chapter. He, he, he was a man of purpose. And obviously now we've seen a man of prayer. And we're going to discover, as we all are aware on some level, that Daniel was a great man of prophecy as well. The 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And notice what it says beginning in verse... 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made the foolish <coughs> made the foolish made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, by the world of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The value of the righteous. Although many would discount the value of the righteous, we see from our passage here tonight, and we see, see from our text in, in uh, Daniel chapter 2, and as well as complimentary text in 1 Corinthians, that the wisdom of this world at its peak is but nothing compared to the wisdom of God. That's right. The value of the righteous is that the righteous have a walk with God. And therefore, the righteous can be in tune with the heart of God, with the will of God. They will seek his word so that they can apply it to their lives. You know, not only do we see that the, the world would discount the value of righteousness, but there are even some who claim to know Christ as their personal Savior, who have believed the lie of the devil. They think that if we're going to really enjoy life, we need to live it up our way because to live life God's way would be a detriment to our fun or our joy or our happiness. You know, nothing could be further from the truth. That's right. <clears throat> nothing could be further from the truth. If, if God's your creator, and he is, everyone on planet Earth should be reminded of that fact. Amen. 
that would help with a lot of this foolishness that we're seeing propagated in our uh, government schools. If someone has justly claimed the engine of atheism, but be thankful for Christian education. Yeah. Uh, I know we have young people that uh, are in government schools. I'm thankful that we have the privilege and opportunity still today, for the most part, we've seen it under threat in the last few years, but we have the privilege to, to freely assemble. We have religious freedom in this country. We have the right and, and privilege of free speech. We can look into the word of God. We can know the truth. And even if you're in a, a, a godless school, you can know God. And you should. You should walk with him. But God is your creator. God is also the author of your life. God created us, and God is the author of our life, so therefore we live at his pleasure. If we understand that God's our creator and God controls our life, then doesn't it make sense that he would know best how we should live our life? Isn't it a backwards thing and I, I want to help you with this. Some of you are dealing with people in your life who think that living the Christian life is doldrum, and why would I want to live that way? Isn't it a backwards way to think that I would know how to live my life better than God would? Just ponder on that for a second. And the next time you're challenged about being righteous or living as a Christian and how horrible that must be, just think for a second about the fact that God's my creator. He's the author of my life. God would know how I could and should enjoy life to its fullest. Right. That makes sense. The opposite argument doesn't make sense. In fact, the opposite argument has been proven wrong. Are you listening? Every time it's been tried. I'm amazed at the people who've made a mess of their life Sometimes we refer to it as spaghetti. They made a mess of their life, and you propose to them Bible truth and principle, and they go, you know, I just don't know if I want to go that far. I, you know, I kind of enjoy, and they're, and it's always something that is an idol to them. Whatever it may be, I kind of enjoyed this sinful practice, so I don't know that I could sell out to God. And sometimes I want to be super blunt, and I'm, I'm usually not. I'm usually trying to be kind and couth and those things, you know. Uh, but you just want to look at them and say, your life's a mess. You do realize that's why you're in, in my presence and we're talking, right? You do understand your life is a mess. And you're saying that rather than do things God's way, you want to continue to do them your way because you want to make your life more of a mess than it is? I mean, are we? let's be reasonable, right? What does God say? Come now, let us reason together. Think, think about the, the value of righteousness. And we as God's people should understand that righteousness is valuable and it should be our pursuit. Right. It should be our pursuit. Now, obviously, we know we can't make ourselves righteous. That's only by faith in the finished work of Christ at Calvary. Amen. We understand the gospel of Christ. But as believers, we need to be all in in pursuing Christ and living a life that is holy unto God, sanctified, set apart unto him. So, so the mo most people certainly do discount the value of, the ri of righteousness. But think about this. Many also disdain the values of the righteous. What do we mean by that? You know, a righteous person believes God. Amen. A righteous person believes that this is truth. That's right. A, right, a person that's right with God believes his word. God cannot lie. His word is truth. A person that is righteous, by definition, in order to be righteous, it's got to be right before God. Agreed? Yeah. It's got to be right before God. So a person that is righteous believes what God says about salvation. Salvation truth and about scripture truth. We understand the Bible, that, that the word of God is just that. It's God's word. A righteous person believes God or trusts God. An unrighteous person rejects this. If you're rejecting the word of God, you are not right with God. That's right. If I reject the word of God, I am not right with God. 
about what we would call little bitty white lies or doozies. In either case, if I am, if I am rejecting the word of God, right, I, I am not living righteously. A righteous person receives the word of God. He doesn't reject it. He doesn't rebel against the truth. An, un, an unrighteous person would reject God's word. They would rebel against the truth and, and they would believe a lie, such as I described earlier. You know, the world's way isn't all that bad. It's not working, friend. It hasn't worked for the last couple thousand years. We've got pretty good historical records to verify that. We can even go back a few thousand more years and see in the history record that's very accurate that didn't work out too well for them either. Right? Remember what we say, say about Solomon, wisest man to have ever lived, right? If Solomon would have uh, obeyed and believed much of what God gave him to pen in the Proverbs, he'd have had a pretty good life. He sure messed up his life, didn't he? He rejected the truth. There came a place in his life where he rebelled against the truth. We can be righteous and we should have, we should value, value the righteous. So that is what's going on here in Babylon. Babylon has rejected the true God. God has allowed them to go in and, and bring Israel into bondage because of judgment against, against Israel. But Babylon is an idolatrous place, right? We understand that. King Nebuchadnezzar brought, brought the captives back and he, 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 uh, uh, brought the wealth back and, and he was honoring of his idols his his gods but when when the crisis came even among the world's people there they knew there was something different about the godly right there was a value placed on the righteous right there was a reason that daniel got his request granted and the other worldly unrighteous so-called wise men did not get their request granted why? There's a val there was a value for the righteous. When the crisis came, the world went looking for a trustworthy person. And who was that? It was a righteous man. We know that Ariot trusted Daniel. We realize, and we mentioned this last time, we reemphasize it tonight, that Ariot risked his own head by bringing Daniel before Nebuchadnezzar. The easiest thing for Ariot to have done was said, Sorry, Daniel, you're going to the executioners. Block, whatever that may be. I don't know if it was going to be a lion's den or a sword, an axe, or what. We don't know how they were going to be executed, but he goes, nope, I'm not risking my life. I mean, the king's obviously upset. He's called for all of you to be slain. But Ariot trusted Daniel. Why? Because Daniel was trustworthy. There's no doubt in my mind that word spread about Daniel's purpose back three years ago before this event when the training began, and Daniel said, look, we can't eat or partake of these things that have been offered to the idols. No doubt, everybody in the palace knew about it. And everybody in the palace had also come to understand, look, these guys are wiser than the rest. They were trustworthy. Why? There was a, there was a value placed, there's a value placed on righteousness. Are you a trustworthy Christian? Are you a person of your word? You know, as a believer, if you can't keep your word, you need to be quick to make it right. And let me say it this way. If you can't keep your word, you need to fess up to the person you can't keep your word to, and it ought to be for cause. Right. Not because you changed your mind. And if, if, if you're hindered and unable to keep your word, you need, to, you need to make that thing right. Whether it be with a brother or sister in Christ or uh, your employer or an employee or whatever the case might be, there ought to be an equitable reason for your failure to do so. We ought to be men and women, boys and girls as Christians. We ought to be people of our word. We also ought to be a, be a person or be people of punctuality. We ought to be on time. You know, being punctual says that I value your time. Right. Let me run that by you again because I want you to think about that. Let me say it differently. When I'm late, I'm saying my time's more important than yours. So if I'm late, I ought to have an equitable reason for when I'm late. Not I had to see the last two plays of the ball game. I, I lost track of time. You know, it's amazing how we lose track of time for, for things that aren't important to us. 
We'll be on time for things that matter. Right? Uh, be, be, be a person of punctuality. Be a person of dependability. What's that? Pay your bills. And at work, do more than is required. John Butler, Bible commenter, said this. The world often hates righteous people, but the world owes their preservation to the righteous. That's right. You know, God would have preserved Sodom and Gomorrah had there been a few more righteous people there. Think about that. That might give us a clue as to why God's held back his judgment on our beloved nation for so many years for our national sins. We as God's people are responsible before the Lord. And although the world may look upon us with mockery and disdain, the world is depending on us to be true to God. The world needs the truth. Had it not been for a righteous few, all of the wise men, astrologers, magicians, and soothsayers would have been executed. You know, I noticed something else here about Daniel that's, that's interesting to me. It would have been very, he, he very easily could have encouraged the king to, to eliminate all this competition. Do you see that in the story here? I mean, we know Daniel's character, so we know he didn't do that, but it would not have been hard for him to go, you know what, these guys are a bunch of devil worshipers. Hey, king, they know nothing. Why don't you just, since you got an execution plan, save me, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, get rid of them. And Daniel had a heart for others. All right. Daniel had a heart for other people. And that wasn't his position to make that suggestion. So we see Daniel's heart for other people in this, the value of the righteous. The second thing I want us to note about the worth of the, the righteous, not only their value, but, but I want us to see this characteristic as well, and that is the virtue of the righteous, the virtue of, of the righteous. You know, Ariok wanted credit for Daniel's success. Did you notice that as we read that? You see that verse 25? I tried to call our attention to that when we read our text. The king answered and said to, or, or yeah, verse 25. Then Ariak brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captains of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. I look at that. I read that. I think about that. Ariak said, I have found a man who can make this interpretation. <coughs> Did Ariak think that Nebuchadnezzar had forgotten about his conversation with Daniel evidently the night before? You wonder about that. You also can see that in political circles, people are always vying for a little more credibility with the people that are higher up the chain of command. Ariak wanted Nebuchadnezzar to hey, did you make sure. Remember, I was the one that didn't do the execution on time, and uh, because I didn't do that, I was able to find a man who has the answer for you, King. Uh, another thing I wonder about when Ariak brought in said, "I have found a man who's able to make this known." I wonder if King Nebuchadnezzar. Didn't say, Q, I roll. Oh, well, Ariok. Yeah. You're a great secret service guy, but uh, a wise guy, you are not, right? Uh, you, you're, you're, you're not the guy here. So while Ariok wanted great credit for the success of Daniel, I see something else here. We see nothing about Daniel in this account that is off-putting to anyone. The king trusted him. The heathen, unbelieving king trusted him. Ariok, a military man in a brutal kingdom, trusted him. Daniel's three friends trusted him. He obviously, Daniel was also respected by the other wise men. Daniel was a man who was, was trusted. He was a virtuous man. In fact, when King Nebuchadnezzar asked Daniel if he was able to make the dream known and expound it. Daniel deflected the credit, said, I, you know, I can't do this. It's not, a, it's not in me. It's, it belongs to God. It's the God of heaven. Yeah. He deflected the credit. He gave it, gave it to the Lord. You know what I, what I see from this? And this is, so, so, this is so lacking in our society. You know, humility is always in style. Narcissism is a word that we've become uh, it's become common. You know, I think the, the, the Bible word is pride. People are so proud. You know, who do you think we are? Say, preacher, how do you how come you think people are so proud? I've driven on the streets of Dayton, Ohio, 
South Dayton, Ohio. <coughs> People are proud. And I might be one of them. I mean, everybody thinks they own the road. I was out with Roland this week. We went somewhere to do, we had to go pick up a part for working on a light out here and had to run down the hardware store and get something. And I said, man, I said, that guy, I said, I said that guy thinks he owns a road. And Holmes said, yeah, we're all paying for it, but he owns it. Just, everybody thinks they own everything. You know, it's, what, what is it? It's, it's, a me, it's a me society. It's pride. Uh, humility is always, always in style. And pride is always troublesome. Listen. Pride is troublesome with those who are right. <clears throat> I believe with all my heart that this is the everlasting truth of God's word. Amen. But there have been a lot of people who stood in these, these positions and stand in these positions in churches across America who are lifted up with pride. And so their message, their message becomes off-putting. Why? Right, they're proud. You can be right without being bombastic. And you should be. Now, pride is ugly. Don't let it creep into your life. The virtue. So we see the value of the righteous, the virtue of the righteous. Then lastly tonight, I want us to see the valor of the righteous. You know, Daniel was a very courageous man. We saw that in chapter 1 with his purpose. He could have risked his life. But he's courageous here again. You were see or can you recognize the amazing courage valor and confidence that Daniel had in peace from God that God had revealed to him the dream and that God had given him the prophecy might I remind us all that Daniel is probably around 20 years old at this time in his life we think about Daniel the great prophet who served all these kings yeah, let's remember he was near to a night to a teenager at this, this stage of the of the account here that we're reading. His courage is amazing. You say, well, you know, when you're young, you're dumb. Uh, Daniel wasn't dumb. This courage was not, not blind courage. He had confidence in God. There's an amazing uh, steadfastness, faithfulness about Daniel that we all should admire and should, should desire to, to emulate in our, in our own lives. His, his courage and his confidence to go before the king here was amazing. Let's think about another thing here about going before the king. What happens to you if you've ever had opportunities in your life where you get in the presence of uh, heroes of yours or very important people? I, I don't know what happens to you, but, but does your tongue kind of swell a little bit? You're kind of going, right, you, know, you get a little nervous, right? You start sweating. You're going, why am I sweating? Why am I nervous? Well, you just, you're, you're in the presence of somebody who's very important. That would be, that's a normal occurrence for us. We don't see any of that here with Daniel. And his, his courage, his, God just gave him an amazing peace and confidence to deliver the message from the Lord that needed to be delivered. And I take confidence in that for this fact. You know what? God brings people into our life that we can share the truth of God with. And look, if we'll just trust the Lord, as I, as I mentioned to you Sunday, just give simple Bible truth. If people want a thesis answer. When Jesus loves you, maybe all they need to hear. Right. You start witnessing somebody, and immediately they run off. Well, but you know, back when I was a kid, you know, this this person at church did me wrong. Oh, oh I see. I understand. I'm sorry that that happened. By the way, do you know that uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? Do you know you're a sinner? That person at church did you wrong. They're a sinner, just like I'm a sinner, just like you're a sinner. What do you do? You're bringing them back to the gospel. They're not going to understand that church people are just saved sinners trying to live for the Lord until they accept the fact that they're a sinner and they need a Savior. Bring them back to the truth of the gospel. Whatever the occasion may be, if they're saved, bring them back to Bible truth. What are you doing with Bible truth? Don't criticize my activity. What about your activity? You're not going to answer to the Lord for my activity. You're going to answer for yours. You're not going to answer the Lord for that person in that church years ago that did you wrong. You're going to answer for what you've done with the truth. What will you do with the truth? Uh, he was a person of amazing, amazing cur uh, 
courage. People who walk with God enjoy a quiet confidence that others do not. Don't we appreciate those kind of people in our life? Think about some of your heroes, maybe in the church that are alive today. And I know usually when we talk about heroes, we think about people from the past. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Remember, the just is blessed. I think about people like, and some of us will remember Dr. Mel Rudder. Dr. Mel Rudder was not perfect, but there was a quiet confidence about him. He walked with the Lord. Yeah. You just knew it. I mean, I mean, I'll say it this way. When he prayed, you felt like you might ought to take your shoes off. It's, he was talking to God. You knew it. But he had to walk with the Lord. Right? There, there are other people in our lives, and, and I'm thankful for the for, uh, the blessing of faithful people in our church now. Right? We're grateful for those those people in our life and, and others. I won't keep calling names or I'll miss somebody and someone will be offended. And we shouldn't do that. Uh, don't get offended by that. But we're grateful for the memory of the just. So we see the valor of the righteous. Right? First of all, let me give you two sub-points here to this, this uh, point three. First of all, the seriousness in the king's requirements. Nebuchadnezzar was rushed in before the king, and what did the king say? Verse 26. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Nebuchadnezzar was unrelenting in what was required. You need to tell me what the dream was, and you need to tell me what it means. You need to tell me what the dream was, make the dream known, and make the dream make sense. We can also see here the skepticism in the king's question. Art thou able? Again, I think he was probably one of the youngest among the wise men. Daniel, no doubt, would have thought, you know, this is going to, the guy that's going to have the answer for me is going to be in one of those scholarly dudes with that weird long beard and a lot of gray hair and maybe some fault now. And, and uh, walking around kind of hunched over because he's been reading books all his life. What's this young punk going to tell me? Art thou here? You know, the lost do not and will not understand the Christian faith. Don't expect your lost or wayward friends or family members to understand your walk with God. They're not going to understand it until they, until they, first of all, know him, trust him as their Savior, and they begin to walk with him. That's right. They're not going to understand. And you can talk to your blue in the face to try to help them understand, but until they, by faith, receive Christ as their Savior, and then they, by faith, take steps walking with the Lord, they're not going to understand. It amazes me. I'm, I know all of us have experienced this. Isn't it amazing the number of people in our life, believers, who have walked away from God, are being chastened of the Lord, and you try to help them see, look, God's trying to get your attention, and they look at you like you're crazy, and they don't want to hear it. And, and you step back and go, but I care about you. What's it going to take? Well, you see that God's trying to get your attention here. What's it going to take? What's it going to take? The lost don't and won't understand. They will not understand the Christian, Christian faith. And the unfaithful doubt the value of faithfulness. I think of probably the greatest example in the Bible that has got to be Lot. Lot did not understand, he, he did not value righteousness. When this challenge from Abraham came to him and said, look, our herdsmen are quarreling with each other. Uh, you go right, I'll go left. You go left, I'll go right. Lot said, you know, Abraham, I think I'm going to go that way. And he went to set a step toward Sodom and Gomorrah. He didn't value the blessing of righteousness that he that he saw and could enjoy in his uncle Abraham. And I was thinking about this uh, today as I was uh, thinking about, or yesterday actually, as I was thinking about this illustration with Abraham and Lot. I would guess, because many times it's true, that the, the early season of that separation, Lot probably did better than he They didn't like the world. They didn't like the devil. You know, you go my way, we're going to have a lot of fun for about that long. And Lot was probably advancing. You know, hey, Abraham, by the way, I'm gaining on you. It didn't last very long, did it? In the end, the righteous were proven fruitful. The unfaithful doubt the value of faithfulness. 
So we see the worth of the righteous, the value. Proverbs 14, 34 says this, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. The value of righteousness. We see also the virtue of righteousness. Proverbs 11, 11, By the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted, but it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. We want to see uh, our, our, our uh, society improved and, 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 and grown up. We need righteousness to enter back into the equation. And God has called us who are his own to represent him. We need to be a righteous people before the Lord. And then we see also the valor or the courage. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24. Faithful is he who calleth you who also will do it. Daniel's trust was not in Daniel. Daniel's trust was in God. The valor of the righteous. The worth of the righteous. Would you be righteous? The preacher, that would be wrong with me to even say I could try to be righteous. I understand what you're saying. But we should pursue righteousness, should we not? Christ has made unto us righteousness, and we need to be Christ-like. We need to be pursuing a life that is right before God and therefore before others. Father, help us, I pray, to make the appropriate application of these truths that we've seen tonight, again, from the life of Daniel. Thank you for his testimony, testimony of righteousness, and help us, Lord, to exemplify that in our lives. Help us to be better witnesses for you, better testimony, example for you. Lord, help us to be courageous, to stand faithful for you in this untoward generation where so many are, are turning, not only turning away from you, Lord, they're, they're, they're making a mockery of the truth. Help us, Lord, to minister the truth to others as you would desire. Thank you for the testimony and character of Daniel. Help us to do that. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name.